in upper Manhattan, there's a lot of apartments. Some strange people in New York City, and I love New York City, it's the melting pot of America. Are you cheering because you're from there or you're wearing underwear from there, which I wasn't sure. There was a 500 square foot apartment, and like most apartments, it had a door, and like most doors, it had a handle. Behind this door in this 500 square foot apartment, the tenants to the left and to the right noticed these smells and these sounds and this sort of interesting odor that was coming out from the backside of this door. They were wondering what could it be. Weeks passed by, no one had seen the tenant for some time. They wondered where or what was behind this door in a 500 square foot apartment in upper Manhattan. So they called the police, the police came, and they actually drilled a hole through the door. They looked inside of it, and what they saw changed everything. There was two brothers uh, from the beginning of time. You can read about them in Genesis 4. Their names are just simply Cain and Abel. One of the brothers brought offerings, first fruits, uh, Abel. He brought beautiful offerings that cost him much. The other brother would bring offerings that were his leftovers, opposite of the first fruits. As the story goes, Cain decided to kill Abel. But Abel wasn't the problem, nor was his offering. If you were playing Clue, it'd be Colonel Mustard with a candlestick in the conservatory. Only in Genesis chapter 4, it's Cain with something in his hand in comparison in his heart. You can read about two other brothers. Um, In John 21, not brothers in the blood sense, but brothers nonetheless, we get a glimpse of Peter and John. John and Peter are together with Jesus, and Peter asks a very interesting question. In verse 20, he says, "Um, listen, I have a question about this guy right over here. Lord, what what about John? And Jesus responds with something very interesting. He says, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? What's that to you? Jesus deals with early leaders of an early church regarding this spirit of of comparison. Jesus asks, what's it to you? But what he really asks is, why are you comparing? And um, I think Jesus asks us, why are you comparing? It's easy to do, isn't it? In a room full of all of these different ministries and all of these different personalities, it's, it's easy to do. In fact, if you've ever had the pleasure of hearing someone else speak other than yourself, you've noticed that you are not the only one that has something to say, but part of our life in the way that we, I guess, bring credibility in the ministry world is we generally check to see, maybe if you're like me, you check how many followers they have on Twitter or Instagram or Pinterest, but I don't do that because that's weird. (laughs) It's easy to compare and look at your life and your ministry through the lens of, of someone else. And Jesus says to me and he says to you, what's it to you? Why do you, why do you compare? If we operate in the spirit of comparison or in and through the spirit of comparison. It does some things, and I've, and I've written them down. If you'd like to tweet these, you certainly can, but in this comparison spirit, success of someone else or someone in this room can be your failure if you operate in the spirit of comparison. Um, your enemies, uh, excuse me, your energies and thoughts are invested into if you're good enough, not if, if God's big enough. In the spirit of comparison, you have to say something rather than something to say. 
Uh, In the spirit of comparison, failing to cheer our brother or our sister or other people on rather um, rather than just being happy for them. Because their success just might mean our failure. And in a small way, maybe we speak a death or want a death over them. We pour out, and that becomes the life that we operate from, pouring out rather than living in the overflow. And there is a difference. In this comparison spirit, peers, mentors, heroes that once inspired us now cripple us. Watching ministry highlight reels, wandering an emotional desert becomes a secret practice as we consume quarts of Ben and Jerry's. Okay, maybe that's just me. In the spirit of comparison, when we operate out of that sense of our ministries, uh, we focus on marketing the ministry rather than just doing the ministry. And and those things are good, trust me, but they are not the focus. Um, We get so focused and we fail to remember that getting Jesus the followers is the goal, not us. Those things are good, but the focus is that we are to see Jesus' followers grow. In the spirit of comparison, I wrote this down, everyone sees who you appear to be, but few experience who you really are. In the spirit of comparison, the lion starts to roar, and we want our brother dead, and we ask, what's it? Or what about them because of because of comparison? When we operate from this, It's toxic. Every single one of us can battle this spirit of comparison and it exists among evangelists, among pastors, among personalities in the church. Maybe I dare say more so than other places that I've experienced. We can all battle this spirit of comparison and replace it with the spirit of compassion with these seven truths found in God's word. There's seven of them. I want to give them to you. Um, But first, I want to challenge you in this. As you're hearing these seven truths, I would encourage you to put them in a place that you visit every day. I would challenge you to place these seven truths in a location that you would use every day. And if you save them on your phone, just make sure you put a little bottle of hand sanitizer next to this. There are seven truths that all of you um, can battle this spirit of comparison with and replace it with compassion. The first is just simply this. In Romans 8, 28, there is a place, a destiny, a before place that we are all called to, and success is not compared to what everyone else is doing. Success is accomplishing what God has called you to do. That's success. There's a second truth. Ownership is our concept, and Jesus claimed none. This was especially hard for me as I published my first book, and I had to put my name on the cover. Jesus didn't claim any ownership. You can read about it in John 519, 530, 541, 638, 716, 728, 828, 842, 850, 1410, 1424. Jesus is always saying it's the Father. He doesn't claim the ownership. He gives it to the Father. And I had to print my name, Eric Samuel Tim, on that book, which is free today, by the way. And you should tweet about it. I spent a lot of my life, and it's cheaper than beef jerky right now. As humbling, especially if you go into a Goodwill and you see your book there for a quarter. You're like, really? Really? I can buy socks that some dude wore for half his life and it's more expensive than this book. And then the Lord's like, see, I told you, I'm just bringing you to the threshing floor. I'm like, okay, I get it. Never mind. <laughs> but Jesus claims ownership. No, no ownership. Ownership's our idea. Uh, there's a third truth. Don't forget that all of us in this room and all of you that are watching from all over the world, we're on the same team in the kingdom. Like, we're on the same team. So who cares how many views Bethke's got 
about some video he posted. We should celebrate that because we're on the same team. Stop looking at your video content through the lens of someone else's video content, just using an example, because Jeff will be here, just using that example of how that can start to permeate our ministry. Uh, The fourth, the goal is to make Jesus have more followers, not your church, not your brand, and not yourself. That's your goal. And that's in John 12, 32. Drive in Matthew 20, 28 can drive you into the ground or drive you beneath the ground that people need to walk on to get to Jesus. When you know who you are in Christ, the sixth truth is this, when you know who you are in Christ, When you are anchored in Christ, you have something to say, but nothing to prove. 2 Corinthians 10, 12. And the seventh truth that I just leave you with, if you want to replace this spirit of comparison that starts to haunt us all at times, is simply, it all belongs to God anyway. The accolades, the ministry, your platform... Your voice, the very breath in your lungs was breathed into you and when you exhale, you are simply returning what was given in the first place. Seven truths that replace the spirit of comparison that maybe you've walked in here with but you don't have to walk out with. Seven truths that maybe you should ingest every day from the pages of God's word in a place that you visit every day. Seven truths that if you grab a hold of these seven truths and start to integrate them into your life and ministry, it will be a year of bar mitzvah for you. Because many of you operate like I operate. Or operated. As an adolescent in your own ministry. It's time to it's time to be a young woman, a young man. That 500 square foot apartment, what they saw changed everything. They simply opened the door. Behind the door was a huge, massive cat. One of those cats you see on the Discovery Channel trying to chase down the zebra. And the guy in the British accent's like, and here's a lion coming up on his prey. You know what I'm talking about? And then it bites that little, like that wildebeest in the neck and drags it back. And you're like, oh, it's so sad. And then it feeds it to its young. And then you're like, oh, it's okay. And it switches so fast for us. (laughs) But this tenant had brought a cub, a a baby Bengal tiger. And he had raised it in this 500 square foot apartment until he couldn't feed it enough. It raised itself to this 500-pound flesh-eating giant, and it started to feed on its owner. And the, um, the tiger's name, the tiger's name wasn't this, but the tiger's name might as, well be, might as well be comparison. Because you invite small cubs, they grow into big cats, and they'll consume your ministry, your calling, Your joy, your peace, your future, your present, your past. They will destroy what God wants to do in you and through you because of a spirit that doesn't exist where he is. What's it? What's it to you? What is it to you? The Holy Spirit started asking me that question. It's hard to, uh, to answer. Don't let the lion of comparison consume you. Replace it with the truth found in a hotel drawer trapped in ink and paper. Let me switch gears just for a moment as we process the other things that are on this earth. These other small little cubs that exist that grow into lions. Um, 24,000 children will die today in a ditch or their mother's arms or a hospital bed because they can't get, they can't get food. They can't get what we uh, just had. 
and not because we were hungry, but because it was sort of scheduled and we're bored. They can't do what I do. Uh, and maybe you've done this. You open up the fridge and you open up the fridge and you look inside and it's full of food and you lean on the top and you're like, there's nothing to eat in here. And you shut the door. They can't do that. They can't go into a grocery store 24 hours a day and pick out safe, clean food. They can't pay at window one and pick it up at window two. So they die from a preventable disease called hunger in a ditch or their mother's arms or a hospital bed. Someone's son, someone's daughter. I have three kids. 24,000 of my kids die every day. Used to be 32,000, by the way. Um, there's a, another lion that is threatening to consume lives. It's thirst. Uh, do you know that every 15 seconds someone dies because they can't get what's in the bottom of a toilet bowl? I mean, not to be crass or, or crude in any way, but what is in the bottom of a toilet bowl in the other room is liquid gold to the rest of the world. But here in North America, we flush it away and dispose of it with our own waste. Every 15 seconds someone dies because they can't get water that we have in the bottom of toilets. The time you listen to a song on your iPad or your uh, car stereo, 12 to 14 boys or girls are sold into a district full of red lights where their purity is taken from them for a $20 bill and human trafficking. These are all lions that threaten to consume, that threaten to devour, to destroy. There was a man speaking of these stats, and I was eating a funnel cake in the middle of Pennsylvania when I started to hear stuff like that. And I remember like it was yesterday because I got up to leave and go get another, another funnel cake. Uh, anybody else love funnel cakes? Okay, good. You're my people. Um, if we get to heaven and funnel cakes aren't there, I'm going to be like, Lord, uh, hallowed be your name. What is up with the no funnel cakes? <laughs> thought you said there was no suffering, bro. I mean, Lord. <laughs> He's like, hold out your hand. <laughs> Funnel cake, it just appears. There's no powdered sugar. <laughs> That's the best part. Okay, it's total tangent, but God sh like summons an angel over and an angel like flicks its wings. Little deodorant balls. That's where, that's where powdered sugar comes from. Okay, sorry. Those of you that are watching online are eating a donut going... I'm going to finish this later. <laughs> I got up to leave because he started talking about a ministry that I had heard about time and time again called Compassion. Sponsor a child. I had heard it so many times I had quit listening to when he started to say it. In fact, I got up out of my chair to go get another funnel cake because, yeah, I heard about the lady with the runny makeup and the cup of coffee a day speech and the guilt appeals and the whole thing about sponsoring a child. So I got up to literally leave. And the Holy Spirit started to speak to me. I went over to this table, and I found the cutest little girl I could sponsor from Nicaragua, because if I was going to sponsor one, I wasn't going to sponsor an ugly one. <laughs> that's where I was at. Not saying that's where I am now, but the Lord's doing a work. Give me some grace. Relax. But he's like, how could you? Well, it's, there, she's, she was cute. I sponsored her. I filled out the form. I turned it into the table, and they gave me a gift, I didn't even believe it was real. I gave this little packet to my wife, and she said, we should write this girl. We wrote this girl. A couple months later, we got a letter back. I didn't believe it. I thought these letters, like, were, like I would write a letter, and it goes in one of those bank chutes, like, boom, and then, like, boom, and then, boom, like, over in Arizona, and there's a guy that pulls it out, and he's, like, writing in crayon with his left hand. <laughs> so, so it looks legit. He's like, I like football, or as you call, soccer. Okay, that's what I felt like. So I called Compassion. There's a number on the back of this. And I just said, hey, I want to go meet this little girl. So I got on a plane from, Houston, Texas, or from Minneapolis, Minnesota to Houston, Texas, to Managua, Nicaragua, and the pastor picked me up, brought me to her house, like a laundry basket flipped upside down. I didn't know all these things about compassion that I know now, then. Um, let me just speak to your head for a second. Compassion is one of the most fiscally responsible nonprofits on the globe today. 
uh, Charity Star Nav- Na- Navigator. They do this assessment every year, five stars for however many years running. Like 83 to 86% of every dollar actually goes to the kid. They do it all through the local church. It's not a bunch of guys riding in on choppers, chucking out food, saying, hey, good luck with life. They actually are there through the local church, being the church, empowering pastors on the ground to do what God has called them to do. In fact, you want to talk about stats and like, like sort of just algorithms of, of tracking. What we know from Compassion this last year is every four minutes, there is another child every four minutes to a click of a clock that accepts and receives and becomes a follower of Christ. However you want to word it, however you want to define it, wherever theological lever you want me to flip, they follow Jesus, a child on this earth, every four minutes through the ministry of compassion all year long. That deserves a round of applause. Amazing. They do it with food and clothing and shelter, and you go through the list. And one of my favorite things I just want to highlight is simply this. They do it in Jesus' name. It's not popular. Social justice is popular. But when you do something in Jesus' name, that's different. Don't forget, they they killed Jesus for his ideas and his claims. Um, And don't forget that social justice without justice for someone's soul falls drastically short of justice. Your generation will solve the water crisis. But if we don't give them the living water, we never quench their thirst. Your generation can solve the food crisis, which is not a food crisis. It's just a distribution problem. You will figure it out. But if you don't give them the bread of life, they didn't really eat at the king's table. Social justice without justice for their soul falls drastically short of justice. And compassion does this unapologetically in Jesus' name. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. I see this woman that comes to this door in Managua, Nicaragua. It's Crystal's mom. She looks at me and she looks at my wife and she says, Erico, Daniela, you've come. I'm thousands of miles from home and I show up to this woman's doorstep unannounced and she knows me by name. She grabs me around the shoulders and she starts to weep. My wife starts to weep. I cry when my wife cries like automatically, (laughs) or like rental car commercials and stuff. I'm sort of sensitive. And uh, I'll never forget, Crystal's mother looks at me in the face and she says, Eric, thank you for rescuing my daughter. Thank you for being Jesus to my family. Crystal's father has become a follower of Christ. Crystal's brother, Darwin, Um, has become a follower of Christ, Crystal's uncle, Crystal's aunt. We could go through the list of life change that's happened to that family, but it just took me saying no to a funnel cake and yes to a child. As far as I'm concerned, as long as there's breath in these lungs, I will stand in the way of injustice and poverty in the sex trade. I will stand in the way of it. I will say not while I am alive. I will battle for the things that God promised is to restore and repair, but until he does, guess who he uses to do those things? Us. Why does poverty exist? It exists for you to do something about it. Why does injustice exist on this earth? It exists because God creates a space for you to live out the red letters. It's an amazing thing in his sovereignty, and it's hard for us to understand, and he promised is to restore and repair all those things, but in the end, he will do that. Until that time, we do that. We do that. So if you're a group here from a church, like a youth pastor or another group that's here, and you want to sponsor children for your youth group like our church does, uh, and you want to sponsor five children today, it's not hard if you do the math with your students or your young adults or your church. You sponsor five children, I'll give you that painting. If you yourself want to sponsor a child, Compassion has an amazing gift for you today. They have a t-shirt that they'd love to give to you that just simply says the truth. Freedom through compassion, not comparison. I would love to give you a hard copy of the book that I've written, or like I said, you could wait and just get it at Goodwill with some free socks. (laughs) John Piper, Francis Chan, Louis Giglio, 
all people that have not read that book. <laughs> well, it's true. I don't know. I didn't mean, it's not like Louie's calling me. Hey, read your book. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, <laughs> he's probably watching. My phone rings magically or some red phone. It's like a Louis Giglio phone. Uh, never mind. Okay. Sorry, Louie. I love you. Um, if you are here as an individual, don't wait. Don't, don't wait. Sponsor a child. If you have kids, I would challenge you to sponsor a child for every kid you have. Let them be the one that writes those letters. Uh, we sponsor children for our children, and they get to decide what gifts they're going to give so they could give back when they receive a gift at Christmas or so they could give a gift. I mean, it's one of these things where you want your kids to have a worldview. Well, connect them to the part of the world they never see. Uh, on your refrigerator, if you are a speaker or an author or an artist or an evangelist, let me just simply say compassion isn't part of your ministry. It is the ministry. Compassion isn't a partner that comes alongside to, to do those things and help you do those things. Yes, that's true, but it's part of Christ's mandate to us about widows and orphans and poor. It's not a ministry we partner with. It's a ministry we get to do. If you um, have ever thought about sponsoring a child, I want to give you a gift. They'd love to give you a gift. If you're watching online, you can go to Compassion's website and in the comments just put hashtag Wheaton so we can uh, have a count of how many kids that are there. Yes, Compassion has partnered with this event to bring all of this here for you. They do that so we can do what we can do to change the world. My name is Eric Samuel Tim, and we're going to go on a break, and there's kids in the back that are waiting for you. Don't miss that opportunity. Because there's lions that roar for them, just like comparison roars for us. And compassion for us and them can be replaced by the truth found here in a hotel drawer, trapped in ink and paper. Jesus, I just pray that your blessing would be upon each person making the decision, even now, to sponsor a child in your name. I pray for the leaders that are here that are battling that line of comparison. They're having trouble cheering their brother on. They're, they're asking the question, what about this person? God, I just pray that the Holy Spirit would be loosed in their life to just simply ask the question as you asked Peter and John What's it to you? Jesus, I just pray that we would move in a new spirit, not of comparison, but of compassion with each other. Let the lion, let the lion, let the lion die in this place. In Jesus' name, I beg, I plead, I say, I decree. Amen.